Hi everyone, this is Dan with ThoroughCare. As you know, CMS released the 2023 Physician Fee Schedule. I recently sat down with Kerry Nixon of Nixon Quilt Law to talk about all the changes that will be coming as part of the 2023 final rule. In this video, we'll talk about how the 2023 final rule affects remote therapeutic monitoring or RTM. Uh, remote therapeutic monitoring, otherwise known as RTM. And the concept when it was created in January of this year was to allow the monitoring and reporting of non-physiological data from patients. So uh, compare that to RPM, and the P really stands for physiological data in RPM, things like blood pressure, systolic, diastolic, O2 sat, weight, heart rate. Those are physiological forms of data. Those are clinical data points. The goal of this program is to capture non-physiological data. And what do we mean? Here's some examples. Is the patient following their therapy? Are they following their exercise routine? Are they taking their meds as prescribed, medication adherence? So these are you know, clinical values per se, but they're data that's relevant to a provider or a care team that's making clinical decisions and managing these patients. So the goal of this program, when it was set out, was to give more data to those care teams so that they can um, manage some of those programs. And this program, I, I like to call it a sister program to RPM because created almost in the same structure and CMS um, crosswalked the payments to RPM. And for those of you unfamiliar with the term crosswalked, um, it's CMS's way. You'll see it throughout the document. Um, they, they say that this program will be paid similar to this program. And the 16 uh, readings code for RTM is paid the same way as the RPM one. The 20 minute reading or the 20 minute uh, of time code is paid the same way as RPMs, the 20 extra. Um, now there are some differences to RTM. And if we look at, at year one, the program was restricted to musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal and respiratory conditions. Um, it could not be done together with remote physiological monitoring, RPM, and direct supervision was required. So third-party groups could not do RTM. And so, Harry, I, I know that Nixon Gwilt has been one of the biggest advocates across the country for making this program better. I'd love it if you would you know, spend a few minutes sharing with everyone how Nixon Gwilt thought this program could be improved um, and the things that you've done to, to help them. Um, CMS hopefully see some of your requests and then let's talk about if they did or if they didn't. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So this is a great example of um, actually CMS taking some feedback over the course of a few years and getting there with a policy change, right? So, so when RPM, Remote Physiologic Monitoring, came out, we had a lot of um, clients come to us and say, you know, collecting these physiologic metrics is great. But can we also count uh, medication adherence? Because that's a really relevant factor um, in treating care, right? Can we also include whether they're doing their physical therapy exercises or not? Uh, you know, can we include sort of how they are feeling on a on a on an anxiety level or depression level, you know, mental health uh, component? And the problem was with this was that these remote physiologic monitoring codes did not allow for the collection and transmission of that type of data, right? They, it was very much limited to physiologic metrics. And um, you know, as as everyone knows, we have to kind of go with how what the codes say and how they can be used. So when those came out, we really said to CMS on behalf of a number of clients and, and a number of stakeholder organizations, you know, were, were involved with this as well. But we said, hey, you're leaving out some really important, met, important metrics here. You're, you're leaving out medication adherence, therapy um, adherence, therapeutic adherence, therapeutic response. How does this medication make you feel? Do you have side effects? Um, things that the patient could self-report um, to their through technology to their provider and have their provider sort of interact around that and make changes as necessary. So the remote therapeutic monitoring codes that we saw this year come out, 
I think we should be proud that they came out. Like everyone should be proud that, that we all made our collective voices heard and that they were there. Um, CMS sometimes doesn't doesn't get the policy around it quite right. Um, and this was the case this year. So uh, you mentioned, Dan, that um, the way that the codes were structured this year, um, they required uh, that any clinical staff participating in providing those services had to be located in the same physical location as the billing practitioner. We know from our experience with chronic care management services and with um, remote physiologic monitoring services that physician practices are often overburdened as they as they are, right? Their own internal clinical staff doesn't have time to take on new programs like this. And so what it has been very helpful to make CCM and RPM programs successful is having is providing outsourced clinical staff to assist in um, in evaluating and um, integrating the data that's coming in from patients, making an initial kind of determination and saying, oh, here's where we need the patient's doctor to make to make a call here. We see something's going a little bit of awry and we need to escalate this up to the physician, right? And allowing that to happen for a large patient panel potentially with the assistance of outsourced clinical staff can, can be you know, very helpful. And what we saw was that that's not, um, they, they sort of forgot about that or they didn't know how to structure that with remote therapeutic monitoring. So for this year, it's sort of limited. It played a role in sort of limiting um, the adoption and the utilization of these codes because, you know, frankly, um, some of the staff bandwidth um, was not there. The other thing that was constraining for the codes this year was the fact that they um, were limited to musculoskeletal and respiratory conditions. Uh, many of the participants in um, in this meeting today may recall that with remote patient physiologic monitoring, there is a supply of device code. And it does not matter what kind of device is utilized. It could be a heart rate monitor. It could be a pulse oximeter. It could be something different, um, you know, blood pressure cuff. Uh, the, the, that, that supply code applied for whatever the device was and it was reimbursed at the same amount. You mentioned, Dan, that the codes were sort of, were crosswalked from um, RPM to RTM. The problem was that for whatever, like there's there was some internal machinations, I guess, that sort of went on in terms of what, what codes went through the American Medical Association CPT committee. And what we came out with was instead of one supply of device code, we came out with two condition-specific device codes. And because that happened, we don't have a mechanism for the for other very relevant conditions that could be helped by those um, codes, right? Um, and then the last thing I'll say that you mentioned on here, um, you know, as I as I discussed, remote physiologic monitoring has value, but so does remote therapeutic monitoring, and both of them the values are different. They're different for they're valuable for different reasons, right? And so, um, sort of excluding the two of them from being used jointly together um, has been has been you know disappointing, I guess, because there is a use for both of them. Um, so I'll I'll stop there. That was a very long winded explanation. Okay, so RPM. so I think everyone's kind of on the edge of their seats, Carrie. Let's see what happened for twenty twenty three. Um, and so the red didn't make the cut and the green made the cut. So it looks like um, CMS listened to about half the feedback. <laughs> um, and you just touched on the musculoskeletal respiratory. It looks like that one is still going to be in place yeah. um, for 2023. So I, I, you know, us like you, Carrie, you know, we see the day when this is available for every con condition. And then the second one, too, um, it still cannot be done with RPM. So it's a one or the other. And you know, I long for that day when I could do RPM to manage hypertension and RTM to make sure they're taking their meds as prescribed. And those two programs together would be so powerful, um, but it looks like we're gonna have to wait another year on that one. Now, there are two things that did make the cut and um, it looks like um, direct supervision no longer required, general supervision, 
uh, is on the table. So for those of you who are third-party groups or provide services to doctors, you can now do RTM. Um, and for the providers on the call, you can use a group um, to help you. It doesn't have to be in the same room with the provider, you know, like it would with direct. Um, so that is a good development, wouldn't you Definitely. say? Okay. That's and probably then, the biggest positive, frankly. That was like a real barrier, and this is this is a real positive change. Good. And then they added that this one, I think we didn't see coming, or at least I didn't. Uh, they added a new variant of RTM for cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, can you talk for about that one for a minute? Sure. It's actually a new supply of device code. Um, and the, the device at issue would be um, a device related to cognitive, to the provision of cognitive behavioral therapy. So sometimes that comes in the form of assessments that, that ask certain questions of patients that are um, delivered in an electronic format. It's sort of um, another piecemeal approach to the supply of device rather than just opening it up to all conditions. Um, in theory, it's great that we have at least, I guess, another code offered, but they have not yet assigned specific reimbursement to that code. So while the respiratory device code and the musculoskeletal device code have reimbursement assigned to them, the CBT device code does not. They're going to leave it to the discretion of the individual um, MACs, the Medicare administrative contractors, to set a, uh, to set a valuation or not. So until we can determine what that rate is, you know, we're not sure if it makes sense to do that as part of RTM. And, you know, it's one of those things you might have to wait until January happens and see what people are getting paid. I would imagine early in the new year, we would find out, you know, what the reimbursement looks, you know, looks like for that program, wouldn't you think? Uh, if you have an expansive uh, view of early, yes, probably. Early, like the 20th of January. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to hold my breath for that one, but maybe we'll see. All right. So so let's show everyone, Carrie, what the rates look like. We said there's going to be a slight drop. Um, and you can see we, we put in red on the right side what the change is. And I, I think there's some good news and bad news. Um, the good news is there's no major drops. And but Carrie, I think people can say the changes are probably small enough that this isn't going to impact our business or our practice as much as it could have. Would you agree with that, Carrie? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you said, you never want to see red on the board, but unfortunately it's what we usually see, right? We've we've gotten used to seeing that over the years. It is the case that overall reimbursement rates tend to have us have tended to trend toward a slight drop, right? So these these um changes that you have highlighted here on the screen are not um, anything special related to the care management programs. They are reflective of across the board cuts and reinducements for reimbursements in the Medicare system as a whole. As we're putting together our wish list, right? If you and I were in charge, we, we kind of brainstormed, okay, RTM would be an awesome program if this happens. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we we would love to see it expanded to apply to all kinds of conditions, right? And the limitation right now with the supply of device code um, relating only to respiratory or musculoskeletal or sort of cognitive behavioral therapy, though it's not reimbursed, it's just, um, it's leaving out a really, a lot of really important use cases. Like you said, like, is a hypertensive patient taking their medicine? What about a cardiac patient? What about a, a diabetic patient? Um, you know, lots and lots of use cases that are that are being overlooked. If you'd like to learn more about what to expect in 23 or other changes to these programs, check out our learning center. There's links in the description below. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like it below or subscribe. Thanks for watching.